Great. All right, I think I'm going to get started. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, some of you may have heard rumors about a new uh, Intel Atom-based embedded board that's being uh, marketed towards the hobbyist and maker communities. I'm here to tell you that that rumor is true, and that's actually what this talk is going to be about today. So all of you who are here are going to be the very first to hear the public knowledge about this board. Uh, so a little bit about myself. My name is Scott Garman. I work at Intel's Open Source Technology Center. I've been a software engineer working on the Octo project for about two and a half, uh, going on three years now. Uh, and so in addition to kind of working on the, the actual build system itself, I also have a prior background uh, previous to working at Intel, uh, developing embedded Linux-based products. So I worked for a company that makes uh, multi-room home audio systems. These are systems that allow you to play music in different rooms of your home or your business. <coughs> and which you would control via keypads or touch screens you would have installed in your walls. Uh, also, uh, I've worked kind of, again, in the audio kind of sphere, uh, making sound level monitoring devices that would go into very loud venues. So think of things like uh, concert stadiums or racetracks, uh, where the venue owner has to prove that they're complying with local limits on sound regulations. So these devices would inform the venue owner of what the current sound level, uh, sound, level pressure, sound pressure levels are at and you know, I'll give them an audit trail that they can use to demonstrate that they're in compliance. But you know what, in the context of this talk, I don't know that any of that is really all that important. I could probably sum up what really matters in a single sentence. Hi, I'm Scott, and I like to make things. Uh, I'm sure this is something I have in common with most all of you in this room. We all like to make things, whether it's for commercial purposes or for our own personal projects. And it's a, it's a great feeling when you can take a concept and turn it into reality. We refer to this as, as engineering, but it's really a creative process when you can take something that didn't exist before and bring it into existence. And uh, I think it's safe to say that we all get some kind of rush or buzz when we're able to make this happen. And now, at this point in time, I think it's a great time to be a hacker, whether in software or hardware or some combination of the two. Uh, the thing is, technology is changing and evolving so fast. I know it's kind of a ridiculously cliche thing to say, but it's true. Uh, every day it becomes possible to create and deploy projects with increased levels of complexity and capabilities that people weren't even thinking of 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the possibilities of what can be done keep unfolding before us, and the limits that we previously ran up against keep falling away. Uh, there are so many possibilities out there that it's impossible to pursue them all. Hence the problem of so many toys, so little time. So speaking of toys, uh, how many of you have played around with quadcopters before? You know, uh, they're a lot of fun, uh, although it would be nice to, uh, to get some that have a battery life of longer than 15-minute you know, fly times. But you know, that's a problem that technology is going to solve. Uh, 3D printers, another example of a game-changing technology that's coming down in price and yet increasing in capabilities. Uh, and then there's the fun and creative stuff. So I found this thing on Hackaday. This is a uh, device that someone created and actually machined himself that uh, dispenses treats to his dog remotely. <laughs> and the way he set this up was so fun. Uh, he actually set his dog up with an email address. And when you send his dog an email, this device will measure out and dispense some treats onto the floor for his dog. Presumably it'll make some noise so the dog knows that the treats are coming. And uh, that's not the end of it, because if you look closely, you can kind of see a webcam there at, at the top there. Uh, and so as the dog is enjoying the treats, the device takes a photo of the dog and then emails that photo back to the sender. So you get this whole kind of interaction. Um, I'm sure that dog is very uh, grateful for all the emails he gets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he probably wouldn't want one, right? No. Now, another really neat concept that I saw from a kind of like a user experience point of view, well, it was somebody who created this thing. It's like a commuting barometer. So uh, if, I don't know if you can see the symbols there. Uh, on one side, there's a bicycle symbol. And on the other side, there's a symbol for the London tube. And uh, this is something that basically tells this guy in the morning whether it's going to be most expedient for him to bike to work or to take the subway. And so uh, what it does behind the scenes is it's gathering some information. And for example, if the, uh, the weather forecast for that day involves some precipitation, that needle is going to trend toward the subway side. Uh, and then if there's known delays uh, in the subway, you know, transit times, that needle is going to move back towards the bike side. So you know, as somebody I'm pretty passionate about bicycling and bike commuting myself, I thought this was just such a, a really neat idea. 
And then, of course, you can combine some of these technologies. You know, this is a 3D printed quadcopter, which is really handy uh, because if a part breaks, you can just print out a new one. Uh, and then also if you're taking a design and you want to improve upon it, you can start iterating, see how your you know, changes take effect. You know, this is that whole process of engineering new products. And the cost of doing this keeps coming down. The, uh, the possibilities of iterating and failing quickly with low investment you know, keep, keep happening. This is the future of how things are being done. So um, the fact that so many possibilities exist and that the cost of exploring and making something from all this potential that's out there uh, also means that the playing field is being leveled. So between individuals and companies, and you can think of all the Kickstarter campaigns you've seen that have been done by an individual or maybe a small independent group of people uh, who are raising money to create a really like, interesting kick-ass product. Uh, and the playing field is also being leveled between smaller companies and larger companies because this whole scaling down of the cost and scaling up of the benefits uh, benefits you know, the smaller companies even more so than large companies which are able to make those big investments. So I think that the, the next big thing in Embedded, the next killer application that runs on an embedded Linux device, uh, is very likely to come out of the kind of hacking and experimentation that people do with affordable embedded platforms. You know, it's the kind of experimentation that you do, whether that's for fun or for profit. So I'm here to talk about uh, a new embedded board that has a lot of exciting potential. Uh, but before I dive into the tech specs for the thing, uh, there's an important question we need to answer. What are we going to name it? Uh, and some of you may know that, uh, or have seen the pattern uh, in affordable embedded boards that they get named after an animal. Uh, and in fact, there are so many animal-based boards on the market that someone created a website just listing them all. So you can see, if you go to animalboard.org, you see a list of all these different boards. You can see that the font choice is also something that everyone seems to agree on as well. Uh, and if you take a look, closer look at the bottom of the page, there's a footer where the author of this site asked what I think is a very insightful question. Why are there no fish? Well, there is now. So I'd like to introduce you to the minnow board. Uh, we don't have a name for this little guy yet, but I'm thinking Splashy the Minnow is the one I'm, I'm in favor of. Uh, that may not be his final name, but that's the one I'm going to vote for. Uh, the minnow board is an affordable and powerful small form factor embedded board with an Atom processor. Uh, it's a true hackable and standards-based board uh, that is designed for hobbyists, students, researchers, and other experimenters. At the same time, it's also very well suited for heavy-duty embedded applications that require significant amounts of computing resources. Now, there are four areas that uh, we wanted to make the middle board exceptional at. Uh, these categories are in performance, flexibility, openness, and standards. So uh, let me dive in a bit more and kind of tell you about how the Minnow's design reflects these values as I kind of expose some of the details of what this board is actually made of. So performance-wise, uh, we're using an Intel Atom processor. You know, like I said, no, no surprise from the title of this talk. Uh, it's running at a gigahertz, and it includes some features in the silicon. So we have hyper-threading capability and virtualization technology. Uh, I.O.-wise, I think the Minnow is really going to shine in a lot of I.O. intensive applications because we're using PCI Express to power all the major peripherals. So uh, your video, your SATA disk access, uh, and gigabit Ethernet. There's none of this. Uh, connecting an Ethernet adapter to a USB port. You know, the Ethernet is a kind of a first-class citizen on the PCI bus, and you're going to get a lot of uh, exceptional performance in terms of I.O. So you can see this board going into a lot of appliance-like uh, devices, I like to refer to them as. So things like uh, network-detached storage. Um, with the gigabit Ethernet, you have things like uh, network appliances, security appliances, things like that. Uh, Performance-wise, we also have uh, UEFI firmware, so it's a modern standards-based firmware that has fast boot capability, so the firmware can get out of the way and get your OS and application booting as quickly as possible. Uh, and then in terms of flexibility, uh, the Minnow board is one of the most affordable Intel Atom boards you can buy, and it will be available for $199. And I'll go into uh, details of what you're going to get with that $199 uh, in the, just a little bit. Uh, the Minnow, uh, again, with its higher computational power, can scale up to higher workloads. You can do very simple things, such as have a little embedded web server that you know, responds to a request and changes the GPIO line. Uh, and you can also do more serious uh, applications, like I said before, some of these appliance devices uh, and other things that you know, I, I'm sure I can't think of right now that people are going to take this thing and, and make use of it for. 
Uh, flexibility, again, comes into the play with the small form factor. We're looking at a four inch by four inch board. Uh, the uh, board, again, with the UEFI has very extensive capabilities you can do in terms of firmware, pre-boot capability, firmware applications. Uh, and then we take the expandability of the board very seriously, too. Uh, so we have uh, what, what we're calling minnow board lures. And these lures will allow you to uh, create add-on boards uh, that would add things like you know, display support, wireless capability, additional I.O. options, uh, and so on. Uh, now, one of the things I'm most excited about with this board is the fact that the Minnow is the first Atom-based board on the market which is fully open source hardware. So you don't need to sign any NDAs to obtain the complete schematics of the board. Uh, that means for any of the entrepreneurs in the audience, you can, you're free to spin your own Minnow board and customize it any way you want. Uh, and CircuitCo is happy to do this for you too, being the you know, designers and manufacturers of this board. They're the experts in it and they're available to help you out with that if you need it. Which license what? Uh, well, the schematics are just going to be available. It's, just, it's going to be more public domain, I guess. So. Okay, sorry. Creative Commons. Thank you. Um, also, in terms of openness, you know, we want this to be an open platform, so we're starting with some open source software. We're using the Angstrom Linux distribution which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, Angstrom is a binary distribution which is very well suited for embedded applications. It has a good breadth of packages you can install that are suitable for embedded applications, and it's also you know, very well optimized for embedded uh, use. And uh, Angstrom is Yocto project compatible, something that's really important for me as somebody who's been a Yocto project developer. I'd like to see this board be a great way to introduce people to the Yocto project and get them working with it uh, you know, at an affordable cost. And then the minnow, uh, minnow board lures uh, are also, you know, some of the initial lures we're going to be releasing are going to be uh, open source as well. Now in terms of standards, uh, I think we all recognize that x86 is a pretty uh, important standard. Intel's been involved in a lot of uh, standards that we make use of every day, so things like SATA and USB. Uh, and then at the same time, you're going to get all the embedded bus goodies that you expect from a, a good embedded board, so SPI, I squared C, uh, GPIO. Uh, and also some other stuff like uh, CAN, controller area network support. Uh, Standards-wise, too, I include uh, Angstrom and Yocto, the Yocto project as well, because, uh, you know, I think somebody pointed out to me that we have over 10 talks here at ELC uh, that are about the Yocto project in some way, so, or related to the Yocto project. And I think the Yocto project is really kind of living up to this promise of being a really great standardized way of, of creating embedded Linux images. So I include that here, too. Uh, and then UEFI firmware, you know, we're, we, we're not dealing with legacy BIOS anymore, so we have an open platform for firmware development. Now, this is the block diagram for the board. I don't know if you can see many details. Uh, it's probably not too important to, to go through each and every option here, but the, the fundamentals here, uh, this board is based on Intel's Queens Bay platform, which combines a Tunnel Creek Atom CPU with the Topcliffe uh, chipset, which is the <coughs> PCH, the Platform Controller Hub. Uh, and you have you know, all of your I.O., uh, for the most part, uh, tied to that, uh, the PCH. So here's a list of the highlights of the Minnow Board's hardware, kind of like in a more list form. I think I mentioned most of the things here. One thing I didn't mention was uh, the board will be shipping with a full gigabyte of RAM. So again, scaling up to all sorts of applications that might be a little bit more memory intensive. Uh, I.O. wise, uh, that PCI Express is really gonna make a big difference in the Minnow Board uh, and its performance. Uh, and then I don't think I mentioned SDIO is also one of our I.O. capabilities for the board. Now, for that $199 price, uh, you get a board that you can actually kind of get started with. You can boot it up immediately and start making use of it. So we include a micro SD card with some software, uh, the USB cable, and power adapter. So uh, nothing to get in your way of actually being able to uh, immediately make use of this board once you get it in your hands. Software-wise, uh, that micro SD card that I just previously mentioned is going to include the, uh, the Angstrom uh, distribution, which is Yocto Project compatible. Uh, this is, to my knowledge, one of the first uh, embedded boards, too, that uh, was done in close development with some folks from the Yocto Project team at Intel. So we've got a uh, really solid board support package, which will be immediately available as soon as that board is shipping. 
uh, and it will be well optimized for the, the hardware features of this board. Uh, and uh, also software, well, software firmware-wise, uh, we have uh, UEFI as a development platform, so you can develop and debug your own firmware uh, and make use of that fast boot capability. So performance, flexibility, openness, and standards. This is basically the laundry list of why we think this board is really compelling as an option. Uh, one of the many options that you have available uh, using with uh, low power, low cost embedded boards today. Uh, now, I think at this point in time, I haven't checked, but uh, our website, minnowboard.org, should be up. At this time, it should just be a, uh, a splash page. Get it? Splash page. Um, so uh, you're, you're just going to find the most basic information. So we do have things like uh, the block diagram and uh, specifications and so on of the board uh, up there. There's also a link so that you can uh, join a mailing list if you want to get uh, announcements of the board's availability. So when is this gonna thing going to be available? We're looking at uh, later this spring. And uh, once we do finally launch, as time goes on, we're going to be adding more and more to the site. So you'll have all the stuff you need. We, we realize that the uh, community aspect of the site is, of the middle board is, is going to be really fundamental to its success. So we'll have documentation, you know, video tutorials, a wiki, uh, a mailing list. Um, you, can all, you can start joining uh, Minnow Board on uh, Freenode IRC. Uh, and then the, the site will also be the central place where you can download the schematics of the board, which will you know, be updated with any revisions of the board as they become available. And you'll be able to buy the Minnow Board uh, and its lures from various <coughs> distributors. So, uh, you know, definitely check out our website. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at uh, Minnow Board. And uh, we'll also there, you'll be using the Twitter feed to post updates of the board's production status. Uh, and if you either follow that or join that mailing list, you'll be among the first to know when that board is uh, available to purchase uh, from our distributors. Uh, the board itself, like I said, it's about, uh, about four inches by four inches. This is not the final version of the board. So it's just a tiny bit bigger than that. But uh, you can see it right here. And you can actually see it running code uh, later this evening at the demo reception. Uh, so definitely come by our table and, and check us out. I'd be happy to talk to you about the board and you know, answer any questions there. Um, and also, you know, this is the end of the talk, so I'm happy to answer any questions.